welcome to our webinar, Teaching About Journalists and a Free Press with Primary Sources from the Library of Congress. Uh, my name is Sarah Badawi. I work here at the Constitutional Rights Foundation in Los Angeles. And if you could just take a minute in the chat to, uh, to introduce yourselves as well, tell us your name, the subject and grades that you teach, and what city and state you're joining us from. And meanwhile, ask my colleagues to introduce themselves as well. Hi. My name is Damon Huss, and I also work with Sarah at Constitutional Rights Foundation in Los Angeles. Hello, I'm Julie Shaw, and I'm with the Bear Education Foundation, calling in from Chicago, Illinois. And I see a few people chiming in uh, in the chat. We've got a teacher from uh, Rebecca from Los Angeles, Michael from Parkersburg, West Virginia. Um, and I see a few more attendees on the list. We just haven't seen them in the chat yet. So um, we'll give them a second to, to let us know where they're joining from. And then we'll go ahead and get into the lesson. Hi, Barbara from Los Angeles. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just tell you a little bit about the project that this, um, that this lesson we're gonna be talking about today came out of. So we've been really excited here at Constitutional Rights Foundation to have joined with Barra Education Foundation and DePaul University. Um, we've been working together under a grant from the Library of Congress's Teaching with Primary Sources program to develop a series of lessons that would make it easier for teachers to inject civic learning across the disciplines. So to bring civic learning into so not just social studies and civics classes, like you might expect, um, but also to bring civic learning into ELA classes and math and science classes. For us, and in, this, in our lessons that we've developed as part of this project, we're looking at civic learning pretty broadly defined, um, really thinking about research-based practices that help us take civic learning beyond just teaching about voting or the Constitution, but really moving into um, the, the things that we know create the knowledge, skills, and dispositions of effective and engaged citizens. So skills like critical thinking, um, you know, content knowledge about voting and elections in the Constitution, to be sure, but also knowledge about other civic-related issues how to access that information, um, you know, what to do when you care about an issue and how to feel like you can make an impact. So really those are the kinds of knowledge, skills, and attitudes that, that we were hoping to facilitate in these lessons. All of which, by the way, are aligned with uh, the C3 framework, um, which some of you may be familiar with. That's the college, career, and civic life framework um, that really places a focus on cultivating um, inquiry-based learning in the social studies um, as a way of, of developing a sort of holistic um, approach to the social studies. So our lessons are aligned. You'll see once you get into the actually looking at the lesson plans, which we'll show you where to find in just a minute, um, that, that they're all aligned with the C3 framework. That's right, Sarah. And uh, today, what you're going to be looking at, what we'll show you is one of our lessons, uh, specifically in social studies, uh, as Sarah mentioned, that grew out of this uh, project and this partnership with the Fair Education Foundation at Paul University. And the lesson we're looking at uh, is specifically on something that we thought about as something really critically important for uh, the day and age in which we live, and that is the importance of journalists and reporters and the role that they play in uh, ensuring a free press in the United States. And there's a way that this can be brought into an elementary classroom, and that's why we're here. Uh, the lesson that you're going to see is designed uh, for social studies, but it can be used in, e in either social studies or uh, ELA, English language arts, uh, class or session that you have uh, during your day. Um, it's specifically designed uh, to meet the best practices for social studies, and that touches on what Sarah mentioned 
C3 framework, uh, one of our main considerations in designing the lessons has to do with the C3 framework and focusing on an inquiry-based approach to social studies that uh, Julie will talk to you about a little more in depth in a few minutes. But that's really how the C3 framework is structured, that there is uh, inquiry that students then apply their disciplinary concepts in civics and social studies to, and they make uh, they, they either take informed action or they present their findings as part of the inquiry process. And that's what they're going to be doing in this lesson. And what we're really happy about, too, is that the lessons you're going to see uh, has been reviewed by teachers and has been uh, tested by teachers, and some of their comments we'll share with you as well uh, in the next few minutes as we talk about the lesson, too. Uh, one other consideration is in civics uh, has to do with the civic mission of schools, and that's something that we find really important, the proven practices of civic education. And so you'll see that this lesson uh, provides uh, high quality just classroom instruction, which is one of the proven practices, as well as using uh, role play and simulation and discussion of current issues, which is also a, an important indicator uh, of good civic learning. Uh, I want to mention too that this webinar is for elementary school, but two weeks from today we're also going to have a similar webinar on journalism and a free press that's geared toward middle school and high school teachers. So if any of you uh, happen to teach middle school or high school, I think a couple of you might, uh, please join us again in two weeks and also pass it along to some of your colleagues because we sure like to see them on the webinar and share the, those lessons with them too. So we'll repeat that information before the end of this webinar. So in the lesson you're gonna see, the objectives are that students will be able to explain the importance of journalists to a free press. Uh, of course, they'll be able to analyze primary sources uh, and we'll look at that in just a couple of minutes. And also they'll be able to assemble the components of a traditional newspaper because we're going to be looking at newspapers historically and the importance that they've played in maintaining our free press. You might even see that newspapers still play a role, surprise, surprise. And the lesson really begins with a brief discussion that you would have with students on just the, the idea of news and the idea of fundamental freedoms, and particularly we're talking about freedom of the press, the freedom of news agencies to report on uh, the events of the day, the events of the world and in our nation and in our community. So I'm gonna start with posing the question to you, to participants here, where do you find out about what's happening in your community and the world? And please share your answers in the chat area. So just think about where you find out your news. And as inspiration, I provided three uh, pictures here from the vast treasury of resources at the Library of Congress. Uh, so you see on the left there, uh, a computer, just like you probably have at your home, a nice large UNIVAC computer from uh, 1959. Uh, there's also a, a traditional newspaper from 1889 there at the center. And over to the right, uh, if you if there wasn't anything printed on this image, you might not know. I wouldn't know what this device was, but it, apparently it is a television from around 1930, an early uh, uh, television receiver, 1930. So just like the TV that I have in my house when I watch the news, or at least they have, 1930. And like people are chiming in, um, you know, we get our news from National Public Radio, other radio sources, online, social media. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, I don't see newspapers on there, but, uh, but that's all right. I get most of my news from uh, the radio as well, from uh, some of the same sources you see here. Actually, we've just, Mike just chimed in and mentioned that he gets most of his info from local news and mm -hmm. newspapers. Yeah. Yeah, it is, I, it is pretty important to still uh, support local news and newspapers because uh, that's where a lot of investigative reporting still goes on. So one of the important considerations we have in 
this lesson and also in what we, the content we wanna make sure students get is the First Amendment. Now, the First Amendment, uh, it's pretty short. It's, it appears pretty simple. And I know for elementary students though, the language can be kind of complex. So really what we're trying to focus on is just the concept that we have a constitution with the First Amendment that protects our rights to do things. And one of the important rights that's protected is our right to freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Notice how those are connected in the First Amendment. And what we're gonna be talking about is freedom of the press, which is the freedom of citizens to publish news stories, to share news events and newsworthy stories with the public. Uh, very important in a democracy so that people know what it is they're gonna be voting on. So people know what the issues are and what they should be paying attention to. Uh, and also, of course, what their government's doing. So this is an important concept for students to know. And uh, of course, you know, there's a whole lot of jurisprudence about the First Amendment that's not necessary for this lesson. But what's necessary is just that students understand there is a freedom of the press, and that has to do with the freedom of all of us to have access to information. So the, the lesson tasks, uh, focus on analyzing the primary sources that we're going to be seeing in just a minute. Uh, so here's an overview, really, of the lesson procedure. After the introductory discussion about where students get their news and information, oh, by the way, you know, with elementary school students, uh, we totally understand that they may not be having the same sources we have. They may not be listening to NPR or uh, reading, uh, reading at the Intercept or, uh, you know, or even watching television news. Um, but they may get their news of the world from their parents, or they may get it from people in their family. They may even get it, they may even say, and this is a perfectly fine answer, they may even say they get it from you, the teacher. You're the, you're the one who really filters the world events and the events of the community for the students. That's perfectly okay, and that's totally appropriate for their grade level. Um, but I just want to point out a couple of things here in the lesson tasks, and that is that uh, students will be examining four photographs that Julie will show you in just a couple of minutes. The term observe here means that students will look at the source and they'll record only what they plainly see in the source. That's important for them to do that before they move on to kind of deeper questions. And those deeper questions that Julie will talk to you about are questions that help students reflect and also critically think about the sources. And finally, they'll show their knowledge uh, in an exit slip and a final activity that they'll do as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Julie, who will talk to you about analyzing primary sources in inquiry. Thanks, Damon. Um, hi, everyone. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about inquiry and, and ask you guys all to chime in about what is inquiry? What, how would you describe it in a a brief phrase or um, quick sentence. If you can type into the chat box um, your kind of thoughts on what inquiry is. Inquiry is asking students to experience all their sentences, senses towards something, posing questions, presenting information to students through their own questioning, gaining background knowledge from different points of view, and then critically analyzing them, question with meaning to the individual. Right, all really um, great ways to describe inquiry. The library um, uses a definition as, as um, defining inquiry as a process of active learning that is driven by questioning and critical thinking. So really all um, very similar to your answers here. And the next thing I'd like you guys all to chime in on um, so that we can all learn from each other is why use inquiry? Why do you use inquiry in your classroom? And, what benefits does it have and how does it help you? So Mike says he uses it to expand critical thinking um, and analyzation. Higher engagement facilitates prior knowledge. Absolutely. Um, and I think the library um, would definitely say that understandings that students develop through inquiry are deeper and longer lasting than any prepackaged knowledge delivered by teachers to students. Right, um, and here we have, by posing a question and then looking at background material, 
it raises other questions. Um, absolutely. Um, aligned to culturally responsive practices, right? And, and then just the simple fact that when the students are the ones answering the questions, they're more invested in wanting to know the answer. So um, really, really great ideas that you've all thrown out here. Um, so let's just take a look at specifically um, a little bit about primary sources and inquiry. Primary sources engage students in inquiry naturally, and they transform the learning process by provoking students to question, make inferences, interpret different points of view, use critical thinking skills to analyze and evaluate, draw conclusions, and pull together disparate pieces of evidence to think conceptually. Primary sources engage students emotionally and personally because they represent authentic voices and perspectives. They tell not just one story, but many stories that help students see the complexity of issues and recognize the importance of context for credible interpretation. Um, so particularly, right, when you can use a set of primary sources, right, it allows you to, the students to get different perspectives and to look at an issue from um, different sides. So right here, you'll see the primary sources um, that are used in this lesson in addition to the actual text from the First Amendment, um, students will be looking at four primary source images. So how do we do that? Well, we use the, the Library of Congress primary source analysis tool. Um, here you can see this is the uh, um, printable version um, that we have. The library also offers an online version that has um, guiding prompts and questions. Um, in this lesson, um, the lesson actually provides, you may use the primary source analysis tool just here as it is, if your students are familiar with primary source analysis. Um, but we've also provided you with a scaffolded uh, primary source analysis tool to help um, the students along with some primary, um, with some guided questions. Um, but let's just briefly talk about the sections of this tool. Um, and here we have the observe or IC, which is something we often use with younger students or students newer to the tool. Um, and as Damon mentioned earlier, right, this is what we're talking about is, is things, details from the source that you can actually see and point to. Um, the middle column here is reflect, and we like to think of it as I think or I feel. So based on your observations that of the source, what does that make you think or feel? Um, and that may be really just you know, emotional reactions, or that might be kind of based on some of your prior knowledge. And then the question column, which is of course we want students to think about what do they wonder about? What does this, this what questions arise when looking at this source? And there at the very bottom, you'll see there's a further investigation box. And that's something that you can use or, or don't necessarily have to, but it's a, where, a place to gather maybe specific questions that you are going to focus on um, in further research or extending the learning. So um, let's take a look at um, this lesson and one of the sources from it and give it a try here. and. And, and work on analyzing it as the, the students would. So here, we've provided you with the guided questions that are in the scaffolded um, primary source analysis tool included in this lesson. Um, so we have here a prompt, describe what you see, um, and some questions. What do you notice first? What else do you notice? What is interesting? So please take a few minutes to look at the source and um, enter into the chat box, um, respond to the prompts or any one of those questions and, and let us know what you see, what grabs your attention, what do you find really interesting in this image? A, a lady sitting at a desk, right? Um, writing, right? This appears to be a, a pen in her hand. I notice it's from the past and not from that 
from my era? What, what made you notice that it was from the past and not from your era? What specific details could you point to um, that tells you that it's not from your era and from the past? Um, the hairstyle and the dress, right, absolutely. Those are the details that the, the map drew me in. Same for me when I saw this uh, image, exactly. A lot of papers on the desk. Um, it's interesting, the map on the wall. I agree. Oh, there's a line down the middle of the US. Right? The inkwell, right? We're looking um, right there. So that can also give us a clue about time. Really great observation. So next in this lesson, um, we're going to um, try to delve in a little bit more on reflection and questions. Uh, one thing just to note, your students may make reflections and ask questions in the observations, and that's okay to note them. Um, but we really did want to really focus in on those details, and now we're going to take a look at um, what that might mean. So here are some of the guided questions from the lesson. So what can you learn from examining this photo? Um, and then we have some questions about when you think it was made and why you think it was made. Um, and specifically, though, we want always to pull it back to gathering evidence from the source. So when do you think it was made? What details in there give you that idea of when you think it was made? Um, and why do you think it was made? And additionally, what do you wonder about? So please, please feel free to type in the chat box any reflections that you have or questions that you had. Okay, so we'd need more information or a caption. Yeah. Oh, that's coming. Um, but just from what what you see there, um, what does it make you think? I would only wonder why there wasn't a computer. I think that is definitely something that the, the kids um, might might ask or think about. Um, I can learn that maybe women were professionals back then. Someone says it might have to do with government function or education. So what makes you think it has to do with government function or education? I'm curious to what, what details or background knowledge you're using to, to think about that. Um, and, and the kids will definitely think maybe I wonder what she's writing. So each of these images here, um, then also in the lesson provides some background information, just what you were asking for, um, so that we find out that she was born in the mid 19th century in Pennsylvania and the only woman to graduate from her college. She was an investigative journalist um, and she broke a big story um, exposing how the Standard Oil Company became a monopoly. Um, definitely something also that um, can be related to today. We often see the press reporting on companies and mergers and are they, um, what are they saying? Is this going to be create a monopoly and uh, dampen out um, competition? So each uh, one of these um, sources can be gone through and I will let you Damon tell you a little bit more about each of the other three sources in this lesson. Thanks Julie. So that's the the image of Ida Tarbell and that's one of the four images. Here are the other three. And so you look in the uh, up, upper left students would look at this image of Upton Sinclair and this is an image from around 19 it's from 1914. Uh, and that's Upton Sinclair, who is protesting the conditions of Colorado coal miners in front of the offices of John D. Rockefeller at, lo and behold, again, the Standard Oil Company in New York City. Uh, so he was a journalist, but who also uh, took part in uh, labor activism, as you can see. 
And then moving clockwise, we see that's Joseph Pulitzer. That's a, a portrait photograph that was done, or chromolithograph, lithograph, actually, specifically, in 1904. And so students would learn not just about journalists and reporters, um, which Joseph Pulitzer was one early in his career, but also publishing and the importance of being able to publish the stories that journalists write. And then finally, at the bottom of your screen there, that's an image of Dorothy Thompson, who was a, a, a journalist, a columnist in the 1930s. And here she is pictured, you see with the microphone, in front of the, <clears throat> the uh, Senate uh, Judiciary Committee, I, I believe it's the Judici Judiciary Committee. Uh, and she's testifying in 1939 uh, to repeal the Neutrality Act that prevented the United States from actually fighting against uh, the Nazis and the Axis powers. So there she is testifying. That was one of her um, missions as a columnist was to make sure that, that the United States could actually enter World War II uh, or what would become World War II. So those are some of the, the images. Those are the other three images that students will be looking at. And they'll learn the backgrounds of these really interesting uh, people involved in journalism. Here's the exit slip I mentioned earlier. And uh, after students analyze the photographs, they would complete this exit slip and assess their own knowledge thus far in the lesson. And the prompts, I'll uh, read them out to you, but the prompts are uh, first that students write down one, one important issue that journalists have reported about in the past. So this kind of goes to the content knowledge that students might have. If there's one thing they learn from uh, Dorothy Thompson, Joseph Pulitzer, Upton Sinclair, Ida Tarbell, just one thing that they uh, know that reporters have uh, or journalists have written about in the past. Also, they uh, use the prompt, a free press is important because they're looking sort of generally, why do we have a free press? If you think back to the opening discussion about the First Amendment and the free, freedom of the press and freedom to receive information. And then finally, they reflect on journalists' importance. So the prompt is journalists are important to a free press because, and they might think a little more closely about what some of the actions were that they learned about. Reporting about, uh, for example, Ida Tarbell reporting about a monopoly, so reporting about what businesses are doing, or reporting about what the government's policies should be in repealing the Neutrality Act, something like that. So something that students can show to show that they see how journalists help maintain a free press in our democracy. And then after that exit slip, for closure, students do this uh, simulation activity, although it's a simulation, but they actually are creating a newspaper. So they actually look at a newspaper. As I mentioned before, they do still exist. And they reflect on what they've learned about the importance of journalists and reporters in the age of newspapers, when newspapers were prominent as far as uh, how people got their news. Um, also might be worth it to remind students when they get to high school, it is very likely that their high school will have a newspaper. Uh, and some high schools have digital newspapers, which are sent out in email or on a school website. Um, and that's fine. Those count. Uh, they, and these newspapers play a critical role in getting news of the day to their classmates. So students run these, these newspapers. They get the information to their classmates. Schools also, of course, have their own newsletters, things like that which they get information to parents and faculty. But here students uh, role play the journalistic staff of a newspaper, and they're actually going to report on some of the happenings in their own school and community. Um, and we provided in the lesson plan a template that you can use for students to compile the different parts of the newspaper. And the way it's written in the lesson plan is uh, students can work in small groups and they create the newspaper that way, uh, providing both the, uh, the stories and also the images, and they come up with a name for their newspaper and all that. You can do it that way, depending on how big your class is, depending on uh, how you usually do things with your class. Uh, some teachers like to do this as a whole class activity, so the whole class produces 
a newspaper about their school and about what's happening in their school community, that's fine too. It's written as a small group activity. You can modify it as you like in order to make it uh, fit your classroom environment, and that's perfectly fine. But this is how students then synthesize what they've learned. Uh, in, in Bloom's taxonomy, they're going to be synthesizing all that they've learned into the creation of a newspaper after they've learned about the importance of journalists and a free press. And now I'll turn it back over to Sarah, who will talk to you about some other opportunities. Great. Well, I'm glad to see in the chat, um, it sounds like people are, are pretty excited about the, this last activity in this, in this lesson that, that Damon um, authored, by the way. Um, and yeah, I, I think your comments are great about it being a terrific way for kids to kind of pull together and, and show their knowledge from this lesson. So if you would like to give this a shot um, with your students, we do have an opportunity for you to, pi to pilot this lesson in your classroom. Um, couple of steps for doing that. Basically, um, if you would just please, all of you, whether you want to pilot or not, complete um, a flash survey. It's a super quick survey um, to give us some feedback about this webinar. And by doing so, you will enter um, a lottery of five volunteers uh, to pilot this lesson for a $100 stipend. Um, and what that pilot would involve is um, basically teaching a lesson with at least one class, completing a survey about the lesson, um, and a, a longer survey about the lesson, and then getting a stipend. Um, also, when you complete the flash survey, which I'm posting the link to in the chat right now, uh, you'll be entered for a chance to win a $50 gift card. So, um, so the link to the survey is in the chat. Um, and if you'd, if you'd like to pilot the lesson in your class for a stipend, just indicate that in the survey. It's, it's in one of the questions. Also, I should add that I'll be sending a couple of things for follow-up from, um, from this webinar. I'll be sending out the recording once we've uh, once we've got that ready to go, and I'll send you links for where you can access the lessons. But I do want to show you now where you can find the lesson plans, since Damon has walked you through um, this, this first elementary one. So there are two places. One is on the Citizen U website, uh, which we're just showing you now. Um, and here you can see over on the right-hand side, you can just download the whole lesson. The plan, the lesson plan itself has all of the links to every handout, website, source that, that you could need. Um, though like Julie mentioned in the chat when people were asking about other journalists who might be included if you wanted to expand on this lesson, um, there are some other resources there as well. You can also access the lessons from the CRF website. Um, and if you, again, I'll send you this link uh, when I send the recording. When you get to this Teaching with Primary Sources page, um, you'll see sort of tabs, Civics, uh, English Language Arts, and Social Studies. Uh, this one, like Damon said at the beginning, is sort of written for a Social Studies class, but can definitely be used in an English Language Arts class as well. Um, and this lesson is right there. The Extra Extra Journalists and a Free Press. You can also see there the, uh, the lessons that we'll be uh, presenting in our middle school slash high school webinar on October 24th. Um, and again, we'll be sending out some more information about that. But if you want to save the date, it will be the same time, 4 o'clock uh, Pacific time, 7 o'clock Eastern, uh, where we'll walk you through uh, lessons related to the, the broad theme of a free press um, but at looking at a couple of different time periods and, and different ways that the government has limited that, uh, that freedom. So that's pretty much all uh, from us. Um, we'll stick around here. If anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to ask in the, in the chat. We'll be here for a few minutes yet. Um, but thank you so much for, for taking the time out of, your, out of your afternoon and evening to to spend some time with us and um, hope that look forward to getting your feedback and, and hope you're excited to try piloting the lesson. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.